As we continue our journey through WAN connections, we move from the leased line into packet switch networks, of which Frame Relay is one of them. We're going to take a look at what Frame Relay is all about. And when I went through the CCNA many, many moons ago, Frame Relay was one of those concepts that just baffled me and I was so confused on. And I think it was just because I, I had a bad starting point. I really just didn't get the big picture of what Frame Relay was all about. So that's how I'd like to start. I'll give you the big picture of why Frame Relay, why this technology is out there. We'll then get into one of the big concepts of Frame Relay. We'll look at the terminology and especially DELCs. That's the addressing that Frame Relay uses. And finally, we'll look at Frame Relay design options. Frame Relay originated as a result of service providers monitoring leased lines. Leased lines used to be the a uh, way to connect and people would just buy dedicated bandwidth between their locations. Now the benefit of that is it's your bandwidth. You always use it all the time. The problem is, is when that bandwidth is not being used, because nobody uses 100% of their bandwidth 100% of the time, it's just sitting there. So the way I see Frame Relay is kind of the same way I see, well, Fuddruckers. If you've ever been to the restaurant Fuddruckers, uh, it is a 50s hamburger restaurant, and they have milkshakes that dreams are made of. They have this massive, when you, when you order a milkshake, they bring you this massive glass cup. And in that glass cup, it, you know, it's, it's glass, and it's got the lines and all that. They just top it off with, like, strawberry milkshake to the very top. And that you'll never finish that glass cup, but almost to joke with you, they give you this silver can that is all of the extra milkshake stuff that they couldn't fit in the glass cup. So if you were to drink both, you would most certainly die. So here's the idea behind Fuddruckers' entrepreneurship. You can go to Fuddruckers and order a milkshake and then take that milkshake, stand up on one of the tables and say, Ladies and gentlemen of Fuddruckers, fellow patrons, I have ordered a strawberry milkshake. We all know if I drink this milkshake in its entirety, I will most certainly die of heart disease by next year. So what I propose is this. I will sell straws into this milkshake for, we'll, we'll give you the, you know, the larger straw, the McDonald's size straw, for 25 cents. And you can tap into my milkshake with me for 25 cents with a McDonald's straw. Now, if you're on a budget, I'll give you a normal straw for 10 cents. And if you are on an extreme budget, you might be married. <laughs> I'll give you a coffee stir for a penny. And you can tap into my milkshake with this coffee stir. So what you do is you sell all these straws, make a bunch of friends, make all your money back on that milkshake, and maybe even a little profit, and you get some milkshake yourself. That's the idea behind Frame Relay, and that's the idea behind Packet Switch Networks. Service providers watch these lease lines and said, there's bandwidth that's not used. Tell you what, let's do this. Let's make a big cloud of bandwidth, you know, gigs and gigs of bandwidth inside of this cloud. And what we'll do is have this in somewhat of a pool. We will sell straws through this cloud or that can connect different sites together. If somebody is not using their bandwidth in Frame Relay, chances are somebody else is. And that's the whole idea behind this kind of network. Now, Frame Relay is part of the packet switched class of networks, of which X.25 was the first one. Now, it's evolved over the years. X25 became Frame Relay, and, and then Frame Relay became ATM. And then ATM and all these were have kind of been transitioning over the last few years into a technology called MPLS. But it all works in a similar way in that you have this big blob of bandwidth, and if you're not using your bandwidth, someone else is. Now, the power behind that is the service writer can sell you cheaper connections because they don't have to dedicate all that bandwidth to you, the service router can also over-provision that cloud. Like, let's say there's, oh, we'll say 2 gigabits per second of bandwidth available here. The service provider can sell, we'll say, 3 gigabits per second to all of its customers, because in all their studies and monitoring and, and testing of these networks, they have determined that, you know, with this ratio, they are able to sell this and still meet all the customer demands because, again, not everybody's going to use all their bandwidth all at the same time. 
I guess you could also think about Frame Relay as a bank, and in the sense that the bank lends out more money than it has because they're making the bet that not everybody's going to come withdraw all their money at the same time. If they did, the bank would run out and not everybody would get their money. Same way with bandwidth. So half of the game in Frame Relay is just getting used to the terminology and how these connections work because it's very different than Ethernet and even lease lines. The first term that we have is committed information rate. This is the bottom line, the minimum bandwidth that the service writer guarantees you. So if I, let's say I had this office here in Arizona, I might sign up for a committed information rate, a CIR of 500 kilobits per second. Now, when you think of a minimum, that's the bottom line. A lot of times in Frame Relay, you can actually burst. It's known as bursting above your committed information rate if the bandwidth is available. Now, there is a kind of a common line of courtesy that if you're always boosting above and always using more bandwidth, the service provider will monitor that and let you know and say, hey, you really need to start paying us more money to up your CIR because you are continually using more bandwidth than uh, what, what you're paying for. So that comes back to the local access rate. The local access rate if, is physically how fast that circuit can go. And this is one of the big differences between Ethernet. When we think about Ethernet, we think of things like fast Ethernet. When I plug in that cable, that cable can go 100 megabits per second. And if my computer can send 100 megabits per second, the cable can handle it. Well, therein lies one of the big differences in Frame Relay. You might have a local access rate of 2 megabits per second, but a, CR, a CIR of 500 kilobits per second. So even though the physical cable can handle 2 megabits per second, you're only paying for 500 kilobits per second, and you should be configuring your router to only send at that rate unless you have some kind of bursting agreement uh, set up with your service provider. So that's one of the, the first differences, is a logical and physical speed mismatch. Now down below you see Local Management inter Interface, or LMI. LMI is the language you speak between your router and the service provider. LMI lies right here. It is a signaling protocol that the service provider can use to send you statistics on the line. It can tell you, you know, the status, uh, the, the relative um, quality of your transmissions, if it's dropping packets. It will even, you can even use LMI to send DELSI information, and that's one of the big terms next. You see DELSI. Ethernet uses MAC addresses, right? And you send from this source to this destination. Well, in Frame Relay, you use DELCs. That's the Frame Relay equivalent of MAC addresses. They work quite a bit differently than MAC addresses, or I guess you can think of them as backwards, but we're going to talk about that on the next slide. So I don't want to get too deep into DELCs. For now, you can just think that every single one of these sites is identified by a DELC, a data link connection identifier that allows it to communicate. Now you notice I put little dotted lines through the cloud. It's almost my instinct. I wasn't even thinking. But those little dotted lines represent our last term here, which is permanent virtual circuit, or PVC. When you sign up for a frame relay service provider, you will typically have, we'll say in Arizona, a single connection to the cloud, serial zero, slash zero, we'll say, is connected right here to the service provider. Now, once you get into that service writer, you can pay for one or more PVCs, which dictates where that service writer can take you to. So I might buy, in Arizona, a PVC that goes to Florida. Now, every single one of those PVCs has a CIR. Now, we're getting weird, right? So, for example, I could have a PVC from Arizona to Florida that has a 500 kilobit per second CIR. Now, I could also buy a second PVC from Arizona to California that has a 800 kilobit per second CIR. So total, if you look at that, you know, 500 plus 800, that's about 1300 or 1 1.3 megabits per second of bandwidth that I have there. And as long as I don't exceed my local access rate, I'm okay. I can, you know, keep bundling all these together. Now, every single one of these PVCs has a reoccurring monthly cost. So the more PVCs you have, the more you're going to pay for your frame relay circuit.
And because of that, a lot of times companies will just have as few PVCs as they can, like what you see right here. Arizona is connected to California, Florida, and we'll say Texas. That's our three PVCs. But Florida is not connected directly to California. It has to go through Arizona to get there. This is actually known as a hub and spoke frame relay design. Again, we'll talk about that more later. The main thing I want to focus on is the PVCs. This is a shift, a paradigm shift for many people, because if you're used to lease lines, a router connected to another router, you can think of, you know, serial zero goes to the Texas router, period. It doesn't go anywhere else. But in Arizona, serial zero size zero could be the same interface you use to reach three, four, five different offices, depending on how many PVCs you're paying for. So it's a little shift. Think about Frame Relay more so like VPNs, if you can think back to that WAN connection video, where I said you've got one physical link, but it can connect to many different sites across the Internet. In the same way, Frame Relay can have one physical interface that's connected many places. Now let's dig a little bit deeper on that concept of DELC. How do DELCs work? This, to review just from the previous slide, is the addressing that Frame Relay uses. It's like a Frame Relay quote unquote MAC address. The reason DELCs can get so confusing is because we're used to the Ethernet world. If you've got two devices that want to communicate using Ethernet, we have a source MAC and we have a destination MAC. When this computer wants to send some data to that computer, it sends from this source to that destination. That's what we're used to. Frame Relay flips that whole thing on end. DELCs are known as locally significant, and let me show you what that means. In Missouri, I might have DELC 200. Texas might be DELC 300. California might be DELC 400. Now, Arizona might have DELC 100, 300, well, hang on, let me not do that yet. I'll do 500 and 900. Okay, these DELC numbers can be any number from, well, technically 16 to about 1,024. So any number in that range. Now, again, what we're used to is this MAC address concept. So we would think, well, when Missouri sends to Arizona, we're coming from a source of 200 and going to a destination of 100, right? No. In Frame Relay, it's exactly the opposite. When Missouri sends some data to the Frame Relay service rider, if it wants to go to Arizona, it's going to send it to DELC 200. That's the destination. The service rider will take that data through the cloud, and when it comes out in Arizona, it comes out on DELC 100. Whoa, weird. That's how Frame Relay works. The best way I can describe this and the best analogy that I can paint for you is going to the airport. This weekend, my wife and I are flying out to uh, California for a little uh, Christmas vacation. And we're going to go to the to the airlines. And when we get there, we're, we're going to be boarding on Southwest Airlines. And we'll look at the little monitor. It'll say, you are departing out of gate B23. So Sue and I, that's my wife, will go to gate B23 with our little infant, Isabella, and we will, we will walk up to that gate and sit down in the terminal and plane will land, we'll board the plane, fly through the air, you know, Isabella, Sue, and Jeremy are all in the plane, you know, flying through the air, and when we get to California, we step out, and I happen to turn around me, and I notice that I just walked in on gate A5, whoa, freeze, right there, did some kind of trickery happen in the air? <laughs> I know you're thinking... Maybe, <laughs> maybe there was some kind of strange thing that happened. No, not at all. All that happened is you left out of one gate and you landed and arrived on another. That's the concept of frame relay. When you're sending from, we'll say, Missouri to Arizona, you leave on Delsey 500. When you send some data, it's going to that destination Delsey or... Did I say 500? I meant 200. You're leaving on Delsey 200, flying through the air, fly, 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 through the cloud, and then you land and come out on Delsey 100. If Arizona wants to get to, we'll say, California, it will send data to a destination or leave on Delsey 900, fly through the air, and come out in California on Delsey 400. Now, with that in mind, let me show you something that might just blow your mind. It might not, but it might. Sometimes 
service riders will do something like this. California has Del C 300 to get back to Arizona, but so does Texas. And while we're at it, let's, let's go crazy. So does Missouri. Missouri also use Del C 300 to get back to Arizona. You might be thinking, ah, you know, everything in your TCP IP body right now is like, you, you can't do that. That's an address conflict. Or you're thinking of MAC addresses. You can't have the same MAC address. Well, that's the difference of DELCs. And now we come back to this. DELCs, oh no, I lost my underline. DELCs are locally significant. That means that Del C 300 in Missouri means something in Missouri that could be very different than what Del C 300 means in Texas. You could even do this. <laughs> Why not? Let's go crazy. In Arizona, we also have Del C 300. Wow. The reason this is possible is because Del C's are locally significant, which means when you send data in Arizona to the Arizona service provider on Del C number 300, they have a little map in their Arizona, notice I'm emphasizing, uh, routing table that says if they send Del C 300 in Arizona, that needs to go through our network, blah, 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 you know, all this stuff you know, happens in the network, and then come out on Del C 300 in Missouri. So, the DELCs are locally significant in that 300 in Arizona means something very different than 300 in Missouri, Texas, and California. Now, you could not, you know, I'll stop the madness right here, you could not do that. Have two 300s on the same interface in the same location, because that, now it's, you've, you've confused it. It's two 300s in the same place. We've lost your local significance. So, that's the, the idea of what's possible with frame relay and how these Del C numbers work. Hopefully that gives you a pretty clear picture of how this addressing works. You just have to remember sending to a Del C is locally significant. Now the last thing I'll say, I was trying to think of where I was going next. Last thing I'll say is a lot of a lot of questions come in of what really happens in that cloud. <laughs> what I'll say here is what happens in the cloud stays in the cloud. <laughs> Let's just leave it at that. I'll tell you, technically, behind the scenes, when you get into that service provider, they tear this Delcy off and throw it away. They rip off the whole frame relay header, and the, you know, as you go through this network, you're probably hopping from router to router to router to router to router to router to router, 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 and coming out in Arizona. If you were to do, a, to do a trace route, though, you never see any of that. It's all hidden to you. That's why the cloud is invisible. Uh, you just see that you came in, the packet's like, whoa, it just totally gets its, its headers torn off, spun around, turned back around, ends up walking out in Arizona, never knew what hit it. Now, because of the way PVCs work, there are really three ways that you can design your frame relay network. You can see that the most common way, because it's the cheapest, is the hub and spoke. That's where you have one hub right here. You can see Arizona. And all the other offices are spokes. So there's my hub. Now, the beauty of this is the cost. It is the cheapest way to get all the offices together. The disadvantages are, number one, you've got a single point of failure. If Arizona goes down, everybody goes down with it. Second thing is now that we are getting these voice over IP networks, uh, we also have to consider something known as delay. What delay is, is how long it takes a packet to get from one place to another. Now with data, delay didn't really matter. You could send stuff and as long as the bandwidth was there and it got there eventually, it would be fine. It might just take the bar a little longer to go across the screen if there's a huge delay. But in voice, let's say you've got a, uh, a phone over here in Missouri and he wants to talk to a phone over here in California. With frame relay, if you have to go to California, you have to go through the hub, Arizona, get processed, loop back around, and then be sent out to California to reach that phone. That can cause some considerable delay, especially if the hub is pretty far away from these two spokes. Now, the longer delay you have, the worse quality voice over IP call you're going to end up having. And you might have calls that break up, calls where you're, it's just unnatural. You're trying to talk to somebody, and it's, it's so long before they respond. You start overlapping. It's, it's not good. 
So we're starting to see some significant disadvantages long day, uh, nowadays with this hub and spoke design. So you might flip on the other side and go, well, let's do a full mesh. Full mesh is where every office has a PVC to every other office. You can see Missouri has full connections to Arizona, Texas, and California, and so does Texas, and so does California. This is the ideal design, but now you're getting into the big disadvantage of cost. This is the most expensive design you can have, and the more offices you add, the more it grows exponentially because then you have to link everybody to this office and add redundant connections and so on. So the cost keeps going up in the full mesh. So what people usually end up negotiating on is a partial mesh, meaning your critical sites, like Arizona in this case, has full connectivity to all the other offices. Uh, California has got a redundant link between Texas and Arizona, but you can see Missouri. Maybe, you know, these guys just play online games all day anyway, so they just have a single PVC. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it, when layoffs come, just make sure that you're not the single PVC location, uh, that, that, because they are not the critical ones. So that's usually a good compromise be between redundancy, performance, and cost. The last thing we'll talk about is the logic or the design idea when you're configuring your interfaces for Frame Relay. And this leads into the next video on Frame Relay configuration. You can design your network in either a multi-point fashion or a point-to-point -point fashion. Now, multi-point, in my opinion, is a poor design strategy. The reason I say that is because all of the routers are on the same subnet. Now, it makes the routers believe as though it's kind of like an Ethernet network, where Arizona can send out a message and, you know, Missouri, Texas, and California will get it. But the problem is, you can see, only Arizona can do that. If California sends out a quote-unquote broadcast or a message, only Arizona receives it because there's only a single PVC between those two offices. So in a multi-point design, all of the routers are on the same subnet. Notice. Everything starts with 192.168.1 here. They're all the same subnet. You have multiple DELSI numbers mapped to the same interface. So in Arizona, Arizona is the only one here with multiple uh, DELSIs, maybe 200, 300, and 400 are what connect it to the other offices. We would map those to this interface, and it would all go out the same direction. Lastly, this is known to cause problems with split horizon. Now there's your pop quiz. Do you remember what split horizon is? <laughs> it came back from when we were talking about distance vector and link state routing protocols. There's a specific video earlier in the cities, uh, earlier in the series that is distance vector versus link state. In there, split horizon was introduced as one of the loop prevention mechanisms. It stops loops from happening in your network. The way it did that and the way the rule works is it says never send an update back in the same direction or out the same interface that it was received from. So if this router on the right was advertising 10.1.1.0 to this router, this router could never turn back around and advertise 10.1.1.0, otherwise you could potentially cause a loop. Well, that loop prevention mechanism causes problems in this environment because Missouri might need to send a route update. You know, we see the frame relay portion, but we also have networks behind here. Maybe, maybe Missouri has the uh, 172.16.1 network back there on its LAN. Well, it will send a route update to router Arizona through its Celsi, and Arizona receives that update and adds it to the routing table that Arizona now knows how to reach Missouri's network. But then the problem is Split Horizon tells Arizona, do not send that update back out the same interface you received it on. Are you getting my points here? <laughs> Serial 0 slash 0, it was received on, so it never turns around and sends it back out. So Texas and California will not hear about the 172.16.1 network update. So the solution in a multi-point design is to turn it off. Meaning, I shut off Split Horizon, a loop prevention mechanism, in order for this network to work correctly. My preferred method of configuring a frame relay network is in a point-to-point -point design or point-to-point -point configuration.
And I want to make sure that I emphasize, before we uh, go any further into this, that this is something that you choose as somebody configuring a Cisco router. You choose whether you want to use a multi-point configuration or a point-to-point -point configuration. It's not something you have to coordinate with a service provider on or say, explain to them, oh, this is how I'm going to do it. Can you please set me up this way? This is something that you do. And in a point-to-point -point design, all the routers are on different subnets. You can see that I have Missouri on 192.168.1.2, which connects to Arizona down here, 192.168.1.1. That's the subnet between Arizona and Missouri. Arizona to Texas, 192.168.2.2 over here. And I'll explain this uh, shindig in just a moment. A point-to-point -point design emulates, as if I were to draw this out, as if Arizona had individual leased line connections to each one of these places. Whereas multipoint makes Arizona think it's kind of like it has an Ethernet network and everybody's on this same shared subnet, which causes a, a lot of strange and uh, odd problems that you can, uh, you'll have to configure. So point to point is just a lot more logical. The way you set it up is create a point to point sub interface for each peer. Notice, in Arizona, I have 0, 0, slash 0, which is the physical interface, and there is virtually no configuration underneath that interface. What I do is I create a sub-interface, serial 0, slash 0, dot 100, 0, slash 0, dot 200. These sub-interfaces work in the same fashion that they do if you can think back to our VLAN routing. Remember our router on a stick with VLANs and we created the sub-interfaces, one for each VLAN? Well, it's the same way here, but we have one sub-interface for each DELC. Now, all these other routers only have one DELC back, so you notice I, I didn't set up a sub-interface on there, but... If Missouri needed to connect back to California and we added a second DELC, I would then go ahead and remove this config from the, the physical and create two sub-interfaces, one to come back to Arizona and one to go down here to California. So point-to-point -point design is allowing you to create a separate logical interface or sub-interface for each one of those connections that you have. This eliminates the problem with split horizon because when a routing update comes in, the router sees it coming in serial 0 slash 0 dot 100. It doesn't break the split horizon rule to send it back out serial 0 slash 0 dot 200 and dot 300 that will reach both of those DELCs. So point-to-point -point design, in my opinion, is the best way to go. In the next video, I'll walk through the configuration of both a multi-point and a point-to-point -point frame relay network, and I'll let you decide which one you think is the best, <laughs> with no subtle hints from me. So what we saw in this video was the big picture. You can see Frame Relay is very different than any other uh, network type that we've talked about so far. We saw a lot of the terminology like committed information rate being the logical speed you can go. Local access rate is the maximum physical speed you can go. DELCs being the addressing. LMI being the language between you and the service provider. So all of those things go together to build this Frame Relay concept. We then took special time to look at DELCs because the addressing works very different than any of the addressing we've seen so far. Instead of going from a source to a destination, you essentially leave on one DELC and land on another, very similar to an airport. Last but not least, we looked at our frame relay design options where we had the uh, full mesh where everybody had a PVC to everybody, a hub and spoke which is exactly the opposite, you have one hub with links to everybody, and then a partial mesh configuration where we have key sites that have multiple circuits and the not so 